the book of Ephesians chapter number 3. Let me just give some information about where I'm at, the message. And I appreciate even the Lord, the way that He's worked to move this evening. Uh, you know, my wife during song service, the, the songs that she, she uh, chose um, about the love of God and then us loving God. Um, and Sister Beth, when we came to the audience and played that song, You Are Love. And uh, initially, for me, when I started getting this message together, and this is where I'm at, and this is what I, I'm putting together, uh, I had a little bit of question this evening because sometimes it almost seemed like it was a little more elementary than what I wanted to be at this evening. But I almost, God's confirmation becomes so powerful in all of this as He um, just uh, gives validation to the word that He has uh, asked or laid upon my heart to minister. Let me tell you where this comes from. Some of you may or may not know, and maybe it doesn't mean anything to any of you, um, but it, it was a bit overtaking to me, and I'm not going to get into a lot of details about it tonight, but I just want to share a few things that I'm, I'm aware of. But over the weekend, uh, some of you may have seen that uh, in the Christian world that there was a huge rocking, um, particularly by someone who had made an impact in the 90s. Uh, just uh, their faith, they have uh, just uh, labeled themselves as uh, no longer a Christian. Um, and the, the tremendous impact they had at a very young age. Some of you may have known uh, in the 90s there was a huge movement uh, in the Christian arena uh, known as the purity culture. And uh, it was talking about uh, uh, dating, marriage, how that particularly young people bring them into this culture of being pure. And, and, and what was the basis of that was very biblically based. And uh, the, the author of the book, when he, uh, he first wrote it, said that he, had, he was born in Dayton, Ohio, grew up in Oregon. Um, uh, he, he had been homeschooled and he prayed. And he said to God, he said, God, I want to write a book. And uh, little did he know that the book that he wrote, uh, uh, that he wanted to be on a small arena, began to be published and widely known throughout the Christian world and became a number one bestseller. His name is Joshua Harris. He's, he, he, several years ago, um, said that, uh, looking back, he said, there are some things, uh, you know, being 20 years old and being exuberant for God that I said that now as 40 plus year old man, you know, I, I'm feeling uh, a bit different about not the basis of the book, not the basis, not the criteria of what he stood by, but maybe some of his, of his ideologies maybe would be re reframed a little differently. And uh, so uh, over the weekend, this man who pastored not far from us, Gaithersburg, Maryland, pastor a very large church, in what many would consider conservative, I'm not talking about holiness, I'm talking about conservative, um, he announced that, that uh, uh, he and his wife were divorcing and that he no longer considered himself a Christian. Uh, uh, and uh, so there's all kinds of speculations, all kinds of things. But one thing that I know, we shouldn't speculate, but we as the church should be very heartbroken over this. That now the mainstream media uh, uh, can also uh, have an attack upon the Christian world as if we're not already being attacked enough by a lot of other agendas that the world has, particularly when we are conservative Christians. Amen? So the place where I'm at, and I think about this, this man, I think about his wife, I think about his children. I think about a man who serves in, in a role of pastoral leadership. I think about the stress of that, meeting needs, and, and uh, your life the way that it is. There's a lot of demand upon a Christian. There's a, a demand upon leadership. All these things. And we don't know what, what, what is going on behind closed doors. And there's a lot of people making a lot of accusations. And I don't think that's fair of us to make accusations when we don't know the story and we don't know what's going on. Uh, but one thing that, that I do know is that, 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 that just 
just seems to be uh, 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 echoing in, in, in the corners of my mind is, does this man know how much he's loved by God? Does his wife know how much they're loved by God? Do children in a broken home, particularly in that of a, 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 a Bible-based home, do they know how much they're loved of God? And so that's where I'm at this evening. And my message that I, 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 I just want to share with you is, is just latched on to God's love. Latched on to God's love. Why do we stand upon principles? I'm not saying that, that, that in our life, you know, that the Word of God and truth is ever compromised. But, you know, we do view things differently when we get a little bit of life experience under our belt. Any of you things a little bit differently than you did as a teenager? Any of you things a little bit differently than you did when you were in your 20s? Amen. Any of you ever in your life look back and think, man, I really had it good when I was a young person. I didn't really have a lot of responsibility. And I didn't go through heartbreak. I didn't know all these things of sorrow that I have went through. Now, Brent, I know some people go through heartbreak and difficulty at a young age. But I think as a whole, I think that we can say that youth is, is, is umbrellaed by the protection and the love of God. Amen. And they don't know a lot of things that, that life can bring them. And oftentimes when people come to this crisis point in their life, it becomes a point where uh, they're, they're ready to throw in their towel sometimes uh, on the things that, that, that matter the most uh, in life and certainly that God wants to matter them because God loves them and crisis should bring us closer to God. Amen. In the middle of crisis, if there's anything that we should be latched on to, should be the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. That we're latched on to that God loves me. Amen. And what is that love? And I know that we talk about it. And there's scriptures and we'll talk about what that you'll be able to quote without even looking at the, 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 the uh, uh, reference in God's Word. Amen. We think about what it is to, to love and accept and forgive. You know, that, 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 that when uh, Jesus comes to our life, that we know love. Amen. And, and that He gives us the ability to love anybody in any circumstance, in any case. And, and that He gives us the ability to forgive. Amen. That's a powerful love. Amen. A love that helps us love ourselves, accept ourselves, but accept others and to be able to forgive with this unmeasurable amount of forgiveness because of the love of God. Amen. Love is amazing. And, and love is something that we have to keep our life. How awesome is it to think about our life? And uh, 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 Brother Craig, how many years did you say you were married? Oops, I'm sorry, brother. I should ask your wife. Yeah. How many you say? Fifteen. Fifteen, brother. Next, Tina. You're thirty plus. Thirty. Thirty-three. Whoa! All right, awesome, brother. That grabbed off quick on the Tina. Press the man. Brother Dennis is getting close to 50. Brother Justin, Sister Beth, and um, my wife and myself will celebrate 10 this fall. Amen. Brother uh, uh, John about me. 17. All right. Good deal. And you know, in the middle of all that, you know, it's about keeping romance and love alive. Amen. And, 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 and realizing uh, that, that you're last going to this love. And how many of you realize that you go through so many things together? Amen. But one thing, when you journey, you start the journey of this relationship of love, you are latched on to love, and love is what holds you through the good and the bad times, and the sad times, the happy times, uh, you know, all those times because you're latched on to love. But the greatest thing of this is to be able to be latched on to the greatest love of all, Jesus Christ. Amen. To, to, to come to know God as a God of love. There was a story that was told of a young girl who was eight years old and she was living in an orphanage and she was extremely shy and, and, and she was also very unattractive. 
and uh, she uh, uh, was, was her shyness, her unattractiveness, some, uh, unfortunately didn't make her popular with the other children, sometimes even caused a little bit of difficulty, even with her teachers in, in, in the orphanage, and so it was very difficult. She had been placed in some homes, didn't work out, went back to the orphanage, and it just didn't seem to be a good fit, and the, and the teachers and the workers there in the orphanage thought, we've really got to get her a place, you know, it's, it's difficult among all the other children here, uh, uh, the, uh, what, what, what what can we what can we do for her? How can we help her? How can we get her place? And one day they watched this little Susan as she climbed up a tree, and uh, the tree, the branch reached out over the wall that extended beyond the orphanage, and she hung an envelope there. And as she hung the envelope there, she she climbed down, and uh, so one of the uh, people that were there, the director, in a very undignified fashion, climbed the tree, we grabbed the envelope, and she read it with a word and she passed it on to her associate and she said you've got to read this and inside said from Susan to anybody who reads this you are loved amen you are loved so anyone who passed by that tree Susan wanted them, wanted them to know you are loved amen but there is a tree that hangs in Jerusalem amen and the message of the tree is this that anybody who passes by tree that the greatest message of all from a rugged cross from a bloody cross from the place of the skull from a very unattractive place amen there is a message that rings out that you are loved amen god loves you more than you will ever know more than what you've even ever recognized amen and that is the great truth of god's word that god loves you Amen. I just feel like I need to say that. Sometimes we as pastors need to hear that. We as leaders need to hear that. Oh, all of us need to hear that. In our, in our life, we can be serving God for a very long time. And we can know it, but we do not recognize it. We're not fully cognizant of it. That God loves us. Amen. The message reaches out and Jesus says, I love you. How phenomenal. How phenomenal. Ephesians 3, verse number 14, the Bible says, For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole of family in heaven and earth is named, that he, that he would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by, by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and what is the length and what is the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye may be filled with all fullness of God, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, a world without end. Amen. Amen. That you be rooted and grounded in love. Amen. That you may be able to comprehend the breath, the height, the depth, the length. Amen. Of the knowledge of the love of Christ. I just need to tell you tonight again, you are loved. Amen. The message that we ring out is you are loved. Amen. We live in a world that is being attacked. Amen. Saying the church is not tolerant. The church is not loving. The church is not acceptable. Amen. Uh, but I need to tell you something. That is not the message of church. Amen. We serve a holy God who in His love, amen, the, the woven the fabric is the holiness of God. Amen. Love that has holiness and holiness that has love. Amen. And God loves people. Amen. The church loves people. Amen. God loves people and accepts people, but God's requirement is to be conformed unto His image which is pure and holy. Amen. And that is a lovely message because when we are transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, we better know Him and love Him and love ourselves. Amen. Amen. The 
kind of love. Amen. Uh, the writer of Ephesians here says that it is love that, that, that surpasses human knowledge or recognition. We really just can't own, uh, we can't comprehend it. It's just, it's beyond, it's beyond anything that we can understand or, 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 or get. But I can tell you one thing, that even though we don't have the knowledge completely of it, we can't fully comprehend it. One thing that we need to do and we must do is experience. The love of God. Amen. The dimensions. Amen. It's so profound. And uh, 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 sometimes we're, we're robbed of the profoundness of the love of God. Would you quote it with me? That favorite verse that we all know about the love of God. You know what it is? You said it. Let's quote John 3.16 together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. In this verse, it is demonstrated the breadth, the length, the depth, the height of the love of God. For God so loved the world. I had a wonderful experience this week. I got to meet with a friend that had been sick and, and uh, just uh, and enjoyed the, the good things of God for some time with this friend. He knew he was sick and he shared how that he almost died and uh, by, by sickness that uh, they were able to distinguish. And uh, he said that when he was in his hospital room, he said it's one of the most amazing things happened that it never had happened to him before. And uh, he, he, he said he, was, he had a headache. He said it was so bad in his head. He said it was just unbearable. He said he, he couldn't really uh, carry on conversations, have company. I uh, just it was so terribly bad. And he said all of a sudden, he looked at the top of the room that he was in, and he said he saw this, this hand, and he knew it was the hand of God. It was clothed with a very white gar garment and, and a looping sleeve. And, and he, he, he noticed it, and it was coming down. And he said he thought the hand of God was coming down to touch him. He thought, this is my healing. He said in that moment, he said uh, he, he saw the hand of God reach past him and grab and say, no, you cannot have and you cannot do this to him. And the hand of God gripped and squeezed and pulled back. And he said the hand of God was gone. And he said all of a sudden, he said, I told my wife of what I just said. And he said, my headache's gone. He said, I, he said it must have been a demon. It must have been a uh, spirit of uh, affliction in the room. But God reached down and said, no, you cannot do this to my child. A reminder of the love of God and how that God is working. I wonder if we really understood the love of God. Amen. And we could see through the spiritual realm how many times the hand of God reaches into our life, amen, and attacks the enemy and tells him no because of the hedge that he has about us because God loves us. Praise God. Amen. God so loved the world, the breath of God's love. Would you imagine, would you think with me for a moment, excuse me, I need to get my water. Would you think about the breath of God's love? Just, you know, how wide is it? How great is it? What is the measurement of it? That God, He loves the whole world, but He loves all the people that's in it. He loves every person that is in the world and the vastness of the billions of people. I wonder... If we think about the world, just think with me and imagine with me for a moment. We don't know if there's life on other planets. We don't know that. Could be. Could not be. We don't know everything that is out there. But I need to tell you this. If there is life out there somewhere, God loves them. God loves them. 
Because God loves the world. Amen. Because there is enough love for the whole world out there. God knows every breath we breathe. He knows every heartbeat that's within our chest. Every movement that we make, every thought that we think, every emotion that we feel. God is aware. Amen. And He loves us as though there was only one of us to love. In a world full of people, a world full of color, a world full of languages, a world full of cultures, God loves us as if we were the only one to love. That's just amazing to think about. That God loves us that way. The breath of God's love. The length of God's love. The Bible says that He gave His only begotten Son. God help us to never forget this. Martin Luther was translating the scripture of the New Testament into German. And as he was working with it, he said that his notes slipped to the floor and fell and his daughter picked it up. And when she looked at the page, all it said was, for God so loved the world that he gave. And the notation stopped there. That was all it said. And uh, when the little girl questioned her, 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 her her mother questioned her about her excitement. The little girl showed her a piece of paper and said, Look, Mommy, what I found. Uh, that, 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 that it says, For God so loved the world that He gave. And uh, 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 it, her mother was prompting, Gave what? And the little girl said, I don't know what He gave us, Amen, but He loves us enough. If He really loves us enough, He'll give us anything. Amen. Do you know that tonight? Amen. That no matter where we are in life, if Christ ascends, and sometimes we feel like the world has us backed in a corner with our accusations, amen, do you realize that God loves us enough to give us anything? Amen. Whatever we have need of, amen, that when we go to God in prayer, amen, that when we pray that God loves us enough that He's able to give us anything because that's the kind of love that we have, or that God has for us. Amen. He loves us more than anything. We don't have to be afraid of Him. Amen. Uh, for God so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son. I, you know, we get caught up in our world and in our culture and we think that love is this. We think that love is an emotion. But I need to tell you, love is not an emotion. Love is an action. Love is a verb. Amen. Uh, 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 the, the real test of love, amen, to what length, amen, will someone go for us? Uh, uh, some people say they, 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 they love us so much that they would go to, the, to, 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 to any length for us. But we find out the words are shallow. It's very emotional in what they're saying. Amen. But God's love is not emotional. But God's love is a love full of action that will go to any length. Amen. Uh, to show us His love. In fact, the length of His love was so much that He gave us His only begotten Son. How amazing that the length of God's love is that He gave us His one and only Son. Amen. He gave of Himself. Amen. To make a way to reconcile us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, he loves us. Amen. The length of God's love. Paul said that love suffers long. I need to tell you, yes, that's true. Because God's love lasts as long as the longest day. And God's love lasts as long as the longest night. Amen. God's love lasts as long as the longest life. 
And God's love lasts as long as eternity. That is how long God's love is. Sometimes we may feel like, how long is this? Will I ever get out of this? But the reminder of it is, is that God's love is longer than anything that you and I will ever go through. Amen. God's love is longer than our life. God's love still exceeds eternity. Amen. He'll love us even in eternity. It is not an emotional thing, but it is an action that continues to go. God loves us and God loves us long. God's word says in Jeremiah, He said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In Hebrews 13, 5, He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In that love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, He says, love never fails. Amen, the love of God. Do we really understand it? I know we sing about it. I know we talk about it. I know we quote verses about it. Amen. Do we understand it? Probably not. We never will. But do we experience it? Are we experiencing it every day? It concerns me. We live in a love culture. It's an easy message to preach. Let me tell you, as a pastor, it's an easy message to preach. But I don't think it's always the easiest to live out every day. As believers, we like to hear it. But do we always live it out? experience. God gave His only Son. God gave Him the Calvary. I wonder if we could just glimpse the Calvary and just try to imagine the length of God's love. We've all heard the story of a little boy says, Who's that? that how much you love me? You love me this much. Yes, I love you that much. Would you love me this much, Daddy? Yes, I love you. Do you love me this much? Yes, I love you. And that reminds me of how much God loves you. That He stretched out His arms and He died for you. Our girls like to say, I love you to the moon and back. That's a long way, but God's love is long. I love you a bush on a peck. Uh, 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 but God loves us more. Amen. The love of God. Amen. The length of God's love. So the breadth of God's love. He loves this world. And He loves you as if you were the only one in this world. The length of God's love. We just talked about that. That God loves us that He loves us. He says, only we got the Son. He loves us. He'll give us anything. What about the depth of God's love? You know, the Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. You know, we can't put him in a box. We can't say that God only loves particular people because the Word of God says this, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the depth of God's love goes so far to the deepest of sinners. It never stops, Brother Eli. You're right, because the Word of God says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whosoever covers a lot of ground. A lot of ground. Amen. It includes you. It includes me. Amen. Anyone who comes to an understanding that they need God in their life and that they need to be saved. Amen. It comes from people from all walks of life. Amen. That's just the best way that I can put it. Amen. I, 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 I think of a story that I heard of an elderly grandfather who was working in his cornfield early one morning and he was hoeing and he saw a piece of paper about the size of a silver dollar and he wasn't as privileged as many of us here today. He couldn't read. 
And so uh, he put it in his pocket, and he just had a deep feeling that he wanted to know what was on this paper. So his grandson, who was getting ready for school, came running from the cornfield uh, on his way to school. And he said to him, he said, I have something I want you to read to me, grandson. So the grandson picked it up and he said, it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the grandson gave the paper back to his grandfather, and he took off running, and the, the, and the grandfather called out. He said, Grandson, what does that big word whosoever mean? And as the grand, uh, grandson was crossing the fence, he yelled back, cupping his hands, and he said, Granddaddy, that means you or me or anybody else in the whole world. Amen. That is, amen, the depth of God's love. Amen. Love, the love of God is not to be kept to ourselves. Amen. The love of God is to be able to be shared. Amen. We may come across folks who feel like they're unlovable. We may come across folks who feel like the gospel because they, they're a sinner. It's an offense to them. It's a stumbling block to them. They don't understand it. They don't feel like God accepts them. But the good news that we can share with them is the depth of God's love is God loves everybody. Amen. He loves. He accepts. But most of all, He forgives. Amen. Misfits, losers, amen, whoever they are, God loves them. The Bible talks about the book of Hosea, of Hosea and Mary, and I won't go into great depth, but let me just give you a quick overview of Hosea. Hosea married a woman by the name of Gomer. Uh, yeah, how would you like to have a wife named Gomer, guys? Holly's um, a beautiful name, I'm going for the night. Amen. And Gomer. Uh, but her name was Gomer Bath Dillaban. If you really want to know her whole name, uh, if you look at her name, uh, uh, Bath means the daughter of, and uh, Dil, uh, Dilbam is, is, is the name of her father. And so when Hosea and Gomer were married, they had a child, and the first child's name was Jezreel, which means a gift from God. You know, that God was, was, was with them, and even in the storms of life, there are gifts from God. But unfortunately, Gomer became unfaithful to Hosea. Hosea was aware of that. He heard the news of that. The second child was born, and the name of that child's name meant not pity. And then her infidelity just continued to grow and increase. And they had a third child, and Lohamai was that child's name, and the child's name meant no kin of mine or not my own. Could you imagine Jose a heartbreak? I gotta be honest. I have some friends that, you know, that share the unfaithfulness of their spouse with me. I'm grateful to be on the same page with my wife, loving God. But there are always gonna be differences between people, difference of opinion. There are gonna be differences, but the greatest thing that we need to have in common is that we love God. We desire to serve God. And we have this conservative, holiness view of God that we want to honor God in everything that we do. Because that is the basis of what we need for our marriage to, to work and, and God to work in the world. And so, you know, when I hear folks and they share with me of their spouse being habitually unfaithful to them, i got to be honest, I would never tell them this, but inside of me I think, I don't know that I can do that. I'm just being transparent tonight, okay? I'm being honest with you. You know, it would be a very difficult road. We don't know how we would respond until we get married. But love runs deep and love is an amazing thing. I've also seen God heal marriages where there's infidelity. And God made the marriage as beautiful and wonderful as it was in the beginning, if not even better. I have some great friends that God has healed and done miraculous things. And it's a great testament. But we're talking about a man whose wife was habitually unfaithful to him. 
He was a man of God. He was working for God. Don't we think when we bargain with God, when we're working for God, everything should be going good? I mentioned that on Sunday morning. We kind of have that mentality, I serve God, everything's going to be good. Well, we can bank upon that if we serve God, that God's always going to be there for us. But we may go through some hard times and things may not always turn out the way that we want. Amen. But we can trust God with the end result. Amen. So don't become uh, disillusioned if things can go wrong when you're trying to do what's right. Because the enemy will test. Amen. Sometimes God allows that just to show how pure and wonderful you are. Amen. The Christ is hope. Once again, I was speaking a little bit. But here it is. That, can you imagine being a single dad? And it's not like today. We're not talking about all the luxuries of having the support of a single dad. Here he is, the man of God, the prophet. Amen. Working for God, single dad, taking care of her children. That's a tough job. All right? I think we can all agree with that. And then he hears that the woman that he loves is being auctioned off. She's been sold. So he gets all of his money together, he gets all of his brain together, he sells. You know what he does? He goes to the marketplace and he buys her back because he loves her. Love is an action. <coughs> his love was great. But the man of God become a paralytic parallelism to what the love of Jesus Christ is for us. That no matter how far we go, no matter what we do, that the love of God, amen, is committed to buying us back and freeing us from our of sin. We can't pay for it, but He has sold all. He gave His only begotten Son to buy us back. I'm talking about the depth of God's love. Do you know how much God loves you tonight? He loves you. That He sold all to find you back. It's uncomprehendable, but it needs to be experienced. That you may be rooted. Amen. That you may be rooted and grounded in love. Amen. He went on down to say, Amen, that, that to know the love of God which passeth all knowledge, that you may be filled with the goodness of God. Amen. The depth, the, the breadth, the, the length, the depth, the height. Let's talk about the height. You see, the height of it is, is it's everlasting life. God loves us so much that the height of His love is to give us everlasting life. And so when we look at this, there's no escaping this word here that we should not, what is it? Perish. Or oh, that makes people feel uncomfortable. We don't like to talk about hell. We don't like to talk about perishing. We don't like to talk about damnation. We don't like to talk about the terribleness of how, how, how terrible hell is. But the reality is, is that the height of God's love delivers us from the pit of hell. That personality that you have, that ability to think, your living soul, Amen is meant with for fellowship and intimacy with God. God's design is not for you to suffer and perish eternally. He loved you so much that He may want to escape from that. You know, in our world, we battle some things. And there's a word called universalism that is a lie from the pit of hell. It says that whoever dies is going to go to heaven. No, God's love 
they don't want to escape. But only those who put their confidence and their trust in God who escape hell. Only those, amen, who accept His death upon the cross, amen, are the ones, amen, who will experience the height of God's love. Some people believe in extreme annihilation, which means that they believe that for those who aren't saved, that everybody will just be destroyed, that there will be no more. That is contrary to the Word of God. For everybody's name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. For everybody who did not experience the love of God in their life, amen, and accept it, and accept the love of God in its height, and its width, and its breadth, and in its depth, that Christ died upon the cross, will die and go to hell. The love of God delivers from hell. And we live in a culture that no one wants to be offended. Amen. we got to be careful about what we say. And we don't want to offend anybody. But the Word of God will be an offense until people accept the love of God and turn from their sin and ask for His forgiveness. Amen. A love that loves us so much that accepts us and washes away our sins. A love that is so great that it changes the course of who we are and who we desire to be. A love that's so great that shows us a holy God and gives us a desire to be like God. Amen. So we change our life. Amen. We need to experience the love of God so much in our life that when crisis comes, amen, when difficulties come, when persecution comes, amen, that we stay confident in one thing more than anything else, that God loves me. And all the world may not understand me. And all the world may not understand the Word of God. Amen. But I am confident in it. The, the tides are quickly changing. The world is quickly <clears throat> changing. My friend, we've got to be confident in the love of God. Amen. That changes our life. Amen. The Word of God is, 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 is truth tonight. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Perish. Amen. Perish. Change. Cherish. Do you hear me? Everlasting life. Amen. We can cherish it instead of perish of everlasting death. That's the love of God. See, there's coming a day when Jesus is coming back. D.L. Moody was preaching in a hall. In fact, the governor came to the hall and he found that the hall was crowded and he was turned away. But those full, there was another man who came to the hall and his name was George. And George said, I want to come in. They said, I'm sorry, we've been turning folks away. You're too late to come. He said, would you go tell D.L. Moody that his brother George is here? D.L. Moody cleared a place upon a, full, a platform for his brother George to come and sit. Do you know why? Because blood is thicker than water. Because he had a relationship with him. He loved his brother. And he made an exception. And he made a way for him to get in. Do you know what makes an exception? When Jesus Christ comes back, that says when others are being turned away, when Jesus said, because you've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, because you've experienced my love, amen, it is your entrance in. You have a seat. You have a place. That is the love of God. I need to tell you my heart is heavy. My heart is concerned. Do we as believers, not just know the Word of God and how to teach different areas of it, knowledgeable of it, excel in trying to be a leader, excel in trying to do various things, but we stumble and because we don't fully understand the love of God, we don't embrace it or experience it, particularly when the crisis is. 